This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. So um, after Stanford, uh, Peter joined a company called Reservoir Labs in New York, and he led the compiler effort there, which was working on a high-level compiler for DARPA, which was for their polymorphous computing architecture program. After that, he joined Stream Processors, which is a startup that is making um, a parallel processing chip and software tools and applications to go with it. So please welcome Peter Matson. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about uh, stream programming. And what I think of stream programming as is a practical way to program um, multi-core processors. I'm going to discuss um, the compiler programmer partnership, which I think is, is the practical um, method for, for programming these processors. I'm going to talk about the particular compiler challenges that multi-core presents. Um, briefly describe stream programming as a way of meeting these challenges. Um, talk about how you can take a stream program and compile it efficiently. Um, and how you can um, optimize that program for the best possible performance. To motivate the term compiler programmer uh, partnership, I'm going to briefly indulge in, uh, in a metaphor. So compiler design for performance is a lot like a two-lane two highway. And you, as the compiler designer, are a lot like this cute little bunny in the middle of the highway, wondering uh, what to do next. In one lane, you have the oncoming semi of opaque compiler optimizations. Uh, this semi has smashed many an academic research project over the years, um, producing, uh, it's, it's, it's easy to come up with some very interesting mathematical representations of a program. Um, prove that for a few uh, simple test cases, you can use that mathematical representation to do some pretty neat optimization tricks and, and magically produce good code. Uh, the problem arises when you try and hand this compiler over to uh, real developers, and they use it. And for some things, it does all right. And for other things, it just gives horrible performance. And since it's completely opaque, they really have no idea of what to do with their code. Um, to uh, make things any better. Well, you don't want to go into that lane. And in the other lane, we have the uh, oncoming uh, semi of time-consuming machine-specific hand coding. Now, this semi has been a, a popular uh, death trap for industry. Uh, actually, usually it only just wounded efforts severely, and they were able to slowly limp along. Um, but neither uh, approach appears to be uh, highly desirable. What I think is a practical approach, a safer approach, is a programmer-compiler uh, partnership to actively um, think of the programmer and the compiler working together. Um, the programmer does the heavy thinking. Um, the compiler does the bookkeeping. Working together, um, you try and accelerate um, the optimization cycle. Too often, I think, when you see um, a diagram of a compiler in a paper, it's uh, illustrated as a linear flow. You know, code goes in, uh, optimized executable comes out. Magic, right? Well, the reality is that for any application, there is a cycle. You write the code, you compile it, you execute it, you analyze the performance, and you iterate. So the real objective of this programmer-compiler partnership is to reduce the number of times you have to go around this cycle to achieve your performance goal, um, and to make iterating this cycle as fast as possible. This is particularly important for multi-core, because multi-core pose some significant challenges to getting good performance. First of all, 
In the general sense, you have to parallelize your application, break it into pieces of work that can be done at the same time. Um, you have to synchronize those pieces of work. Um, and you have to explicitly manage the memory. Now, this, this third item is not um, often listed as a direct consequence of multi-core. But I think it, it is, especially in the DSP world. Um, what happens as you go to a multi-core chip is that your processing power to memory bandwidth ratio uh, goes way up. Um, and this means you have to make absolutely the best possible use of every available bit of memory bandwidth, which basically dictates explicit compiler management of that bandwidth, or explicit programmer management of that bandwidth, or some combination thereof. Now, I'm particularly interested in optimizing for a kind of multi-core called a stream processor. Stream processors consist, uh, in the abstract, of a control processor um, and a high-performance data processing unit. Data processing unit basically gangs together a bunch of processor cores in a SIMD fashion. These processor cores are highly optimized for mathematically intensive tasks like DSP, um, typically VLIW. Um, having this type of architecture does narrow the challenges of multi-core. The only thing that you have to do to really achieve parallelization on this type of architecture is figure out how to take your key loops, your key code, that you want to go fast, and find data parallelism to distribute over the SIMD uh, processing cores. You definitely have to figure out how to explicitly manage the on-chip memory, because this architecture has a very, very high compute to on and off-chip memory bandwidth ratio. So the solution that we're developing at Stream Processors for this, uh, which I think is actually a, a more general solution than even our specific implementation of it, is called Stream Programming. And it tries to solve these three basic problems uh, presented by um, Stream Processor architectures. So how do you express the data parallelism in your code so that the DPU can take advantage of it? Well, in a stream program, you convert your key loops into kernels. Kernels are nothing more than functions. They have a very function-like interface. They're called just like functions. Um, but execution of everything in the kernel is implicitly um, SIMD parallel across the DPU. So if you do A times B, A is actually a vector that's as wide as the uh, uh, DPU, and B is a vector that's as wide as the DPU, and the result is another vector um, that's an element by element uh, multiplication of, of A and B. So by, by capturing these, these critical loop in functions, you, you tell the compiler what you want to have be data parallel. The nice thing about this, this kernel model is you still have the rest of your application looking roughly unchanged. It's got all the code that isn't really performance significant, which in most applications is actually like 90% of the code. And then periodically it calls a kernel, and the kernel looks just like a function call. It has RPC type semantics. So the, the function call is made and immediately returns as far as the control processor is concerned, and then it gets queued up for execution on the, the DPU. So the only synchronization that's really necessary is when you want the result of one of these kernels, you need to explicitly wait for it. Now, this handles the parallelization and synchronization aspects, but it doesn't deal with um, explicit management of memory. To do that, we introduce the concept of streams. Now, it's an old joke that uh, one researcher would sooner use another researcher's toothbrush than use their terminology. Well, streams is, is kind of a counterpoint to this. It appears that everyone loves to use that term. They just use it for completely different things. Um, so what we mean in this case is, is very simple. A stream is just like a 1D array that is explicitly located in on-chip memory. So when you copy data into a stream, you are copying it from off-chip um, cacheable type memory into the explicit compiler managed memory on-chip. Similarly, when you store, you're taking it from, from on-chip. And, uh, and when you copy it out of the array, you're, you're taking it from on-chip and, and moving it back into the off-chip cacheable memory. So these three simple con concepts of, of kernels, um, waiting for kernels to complete, and uh, using streams to specify what memory is on chip um, meet the primary challenges of using a stream processor. Oops.
However, that was you know, pretty high level and hand wavy. So I want to talk more about um, what this, this really means by taking a simple program and converting it into a stream program step by step. This involves a, a series of steps. Um, the first of those is to just identify the performance critical loops. One of the nice um, parts of this approach is, again, you don't change the rest of your program. You just change the parts you care about. Um, convert those loops into a SIMD form. Strip mine or tile the loops so that you can fit the streams that capture the working set for each um, strip mine segment or tile um, in the on-ship memory. Those two steps are, are the hard thinking involved in this process. Um, that's what, what generates most of the work for someone doing an application uh, conversion to streams. The last two are basically syntactic transformations to communicate um, this mapping to the compiler. Convert the array accesses explicitly into streams. Um, convert the um, loops into kernels. So I'm going to go through the simple example. So this is the, uh, the common Saxby example. Uh, it's just a loop over a very long stream um, performing the simple transformation x times some alpha plus y. So the first thing you need to do is simdiize the loop. Um, I'm, I'm deliberately avoiding the use of the word vectorize here, which, which tends to get people thinking about vector processors, which this functions differently from. Um, basically, uh, each register in the architecture, if you will, um, contains, is, is striped across the, six, or the, the, the number of processor cores. Um, so you basically have to take the loop and break it and add a new loop to the loop nest. Um, that is data parallel and iterates a number of times equal to the width of your DPU. And this, this again, is actually something that you probably, when you're, when you're writing stream programs, you would do conceptually. But for the sake of illustration, I've, I've shown it explicitly. All right. So here, we just break the loop into a 2D loop, loop nest. The middle loop um, iterates uh, uh, a number of times equal to the width of the DPU, um, performs the calculation for each of those um, processors. The next transformation is strip mining or tiling. Um, if you're working on data that is too large to fit in the on-ship memory, you need to reduce it um, to a loop nest in which some inner set of the loops has a working set that'll fit on the, uh, the memory of the chip. Um, and this is a common, uh, sometimes automated compiler optimization uh, called either strip mining or tiling, depending on the number of dimensions you have in the loop. Here's an example. Uh, basically, we're just introducing another level to the loop nest um, that is working on strip size elements at a time. So we have our original outer loop, now slightly transformed. Next innermost loop that's operating on a series of strips. And then the, the innermost loop which is um, the um, SIMD um, iteration across the processors. Okay. So now that you've strip mined things, you have working sets that will fit on chip, and you load those into streams, and then you store the result from a stream. So we declare two streams. We specify their size. Um, there's a missing declaration of a Z stream here, but whatever. We declare three streams, specify their size. We load the inputs into streams. We perform the computation. And we store the output. The computation, we convert the array accesses into stream accesses. Stream accesses are more efficient, as actually all memory accesses are when they're, they're sequential, at least for this type of processor. Um, this is because you're accessing a on-chip memory. Um, if you have an architecture built to do it, you can grab a large chunk out of the on-chip memory and buffer it somewhere closer to your processors. And this gets you higher bandwidth. So when possible, you want to use sequential accesses. But these really could be um, more complex accessors that would do an arbitrary um, random access into the streams. All streams are, again, is small arrays that are located in the on-chip memory. So the last step of the transformation is just to pull out this transformed loop and label it as a kernel function. So what we're left with is iterate over the strips. Um, for each strip, load the inputs, perform the kernel, store the result. 
the kernel, just like any normal function, has its argument list, has two input streams, one output stream. The loop over the strip remains. It has to compute as many elements as you can fit in this, this strip, this working set. But the SIMD loop is now gone because this kernel is implicitly SIMD parallel. So basically there's an implicit loop here that all DPUs are performing this operation in parallel. So this, this is a complete um, stream program um, showing the basic anatomy. You declare some streams so that you know what parts of um, your data are going to be in on-chip memory at any given time. You load or store data to and from those streams and you operate on them using kernels which are implicitly SIMD. Okay, now this, this is the part of, of a presentation where I always want to say, yeah, but what about? Because the author or the um, presenter inevitably shows some completely trivial example that no one considers difficult to parallelize um, and then claims it as, as proof of, of this wonderful new programming system slash compiler optimization. So a few of the um, more obvious objections are, what do you do if you have something that isn't trivially data parallel? Well, there is one additional capability that a stream processor can provide that, that can help you in this case. That's the ability to permute values between SIMD processor cores. So each processor core does some work and then they swap a bunch of values around and do some more work. Okay, and this can help. However, really, you basically have to think hard about it. You have to um, look at, you know, your loop nest or whatever representation you have and find the data parallelism. And the unfortunate reality is, is that some things are inherently parallel. One of the best examples of something that's inherently parallel is pointer chasing. Okay, every successive pointer chase um, requires you to complete the prior one. Uh, right, it's inherently sequential. Okay, sorry. Um, example of something that's inherently sequential and therefore not parallelizable is pointer chasing. However, um, just to you know, keep an open mind on these things, if you are doing enough pointer chasing at the same time, it is possible to structure it as a stream program and parallelize it. You're just pointer chasing 16 different pointers at a time and um, you alternate between a kernel that operates to decide what the next pointer you're going to chase is and um, stream loads and stores bringing in the next set of, of data records as you chase through your, your structure. So this is one, one common uh, issue. Um, something that doesn't use linear access. I showed a case where you're just using these simple read and write primitives on a stream. Um, you can also access streams um, using just uh, standard array type primitives. I want to get the you know, ith element of this stream at this time in the kernel. Um, it's just slightly less efficient. And one of the goals really here is to enable the programmer to express efficient cases to the compiler. Um, you also have the case with conditional control flow. And really in this case what you do is you look at, you look at the computation inside the loop and you decide whether um, it's mostly the same for all the data um, and there's a few conditionals, in which case you just use predication. Um, basically you execute both cases of, of a conditional branch for instance and, and just select the uh, correct output. Um, or you use a kernel to split your input data into use cases. Um, there are primitives that enable you, if you think of, to conditionally write to two different streams. So you bring in your use cases, you do some, or you bring in your input, you do some analysis, you split it into two streams, and then you process those streams using different kernels. This is particularly handy when you have one really efficient case that applies to most of the data, and one horribly inefficient case that applies to a, a few data items here and there. So it's, it's hard to get into this model. There are real challenges like these. The nice thing about this model is it's fairly simple to understand and if you do get a, your program into this model, you will get good performance. So it does give you a clear target to aim for. So, so one observation that, that you may also have if you're a compiler writer is, wow, I know how to do that. That's, you know, vectorization and tiling and there, you know, are stack of papers this high um, explaining how to automate these things. So the problem with doing that, um, first of all, is that while it tends to work for 
you know, simple examples, current languages do significantly obfuscate the parallelization and data access patterns, which you really need to understand to do those transformations automatically. But these current languages also have a huge user base, which if you're in an industrial setting, you can't afford really to say, C, yeah, not so good. We're going to use something entirely different. Um, supposing you do accept these limitations and do your best with some smart compiler work to get around it. What you end up with is an optimizer that works most of the time, if you're really good. But you can't do it consistently. You can't guarantee that for an arbitrary loop, you're going to find you know, the best possible performance mapping. Uh, and you can't do it transparently. When you fail, uh, you know, I, I haven't personally ever had a compiler explain to me, you know, performance error, line 253, you know, please rejigger your loop in the following fashion, and then I can optimize it. Instead, you just run the program, and performance isn't what you hope for. Um, and in the end, programmers really don't care that the compiler works for 80% of the benchmark suite. You know, spec mark, great. I really care about this loop, because this is what, you know, my boss is going to judge me on. However, you know, this is getting back to this idea of programmer-compiler partnership. You don't want the programmer to have to do everything. So what can you automate effectively? So what we just talked about is the programmer doing things like strip mining and vectorization and converting array accesses to stream accesses, which really do force you to think through how you're going to get performance out of your application. But most of the work is thinking. So it's, it's you do a lot of thinking and little work to do the transformation. The compiler does the stuff that involves little thinking and lots of work. These are things where we can cast it in a very nice formal expression, where there's a lot of data involved, um, and where we can do a pretty good job all the time. For instance, if you've already strip mined something and you just want the compiler to select an appropriate strip size based on the streams within a loop, we can do that. And we can guarantee that we'll do it well, as well as you will. Um, we can do a VLIW scheduling and register allocation, which yeah, if you've done some um, hand assembly for DSP, you may argue you can do better. But as these processors get more and more powerful, they get more VLIW ALUs, they move to more complex register file architectures, and it gets to the point where the compiler can just handle these details better than a programmer, and handling it manually would take way too much time. The last and perhaps the, the most unusual thing that we can do easily with stream programs is we can analyze them and do things like parallelizing loads and stores with kernels at a very high level, or allocating the streams in local memory automatically. So the programmer doesn't really have to think about, oh, is this stream overlapping with that stream? What happens if I run off the end? Um, you know, have, have I packed things in there as efficiently as possible? They just have to get their code to the point where they're saying, I've got this stream. That's the part of the array that I'm going to use. Then we can perform some very simple analysis. This analysis is simplified by the fact that kernels can only access their arguments. Um, kernels don't have side effects. Um, and that streams, um, which are only touched by loads, stores, and kernels, have very clear read-write update semantics. Um, this is in the sort of formal compiler sense where a write is a kill of all reaching uh, values. Um, a read is, is a use. Um, and an update is a, a modification of the current value. Um, so you have the, the use cases, which is I, I load something uh, from a stream. I store something, uh, or I load something to a stream. I store something from a stream. I use it as a kernel argument. I use it either as a sequential input, where I'm going to read all of it, sequential output, where I'm going to overwrite all of it, or I do some random access to it. You have a very clear mapping depending on whether you're passing the stream or in many languages you have the ability to specify um, you know, a subset of the stream to operate on. Okay. So once you have these clear semantics, you can really treat um, kernels and streams in a manner that is directly analogous um, to operations and scalars. You know, kernel foo applied to stream A to produce stream B becomes a lot like, you know, or applied this. Um, streams A and B to produce stream C it becomes a lot like A plus B equals, or C equals A plus B. So apply a kernel to streams, very similar to apply an operation to scalars. And you can do everything that you can think about doing 
uh, in a compiler to operations on scalars to kernels acting on streams. Uh, one of the simplest things and most useful things is to draw the actual data flow graph for an entire stream program or part of a stream program. Here's a very simple example. I load two streams, apply the kernel foo to produce another stream, um, which is acted on by the, the kernel bar, uh, produce another output, which is consumed by Baz in combination with some more data that I load, and finally I store the result. Now, this is not, um, this is a data flow graph where the output of each kernel is an entire stream. This is not some sort of flow graph where each of these is a, you know, 1D transformation and the, the, the individual elements are flowing through it. You know, foo may do some extremely complex op operation that, you know, does random, you know, complex array accesses into a stream to produce another stream. Okay, so this, this is a pretty arbitrary transformation. It's like saying, I have a set of functions. Those functions operate on very well-defined regions of arrays. And because of that clear definition, I can draw this graph. And this graph, like any data flow graph inside a compiler, is, is good for doing many things. Um, one of the simplest is, is parallelization. Uh, this is directly analogous to doing um, VLIW scheduling. You have a graph over there. Um, you can schedule it in time and, and notice, for instance, that you know, maybe I have multiple memory pipes and I can do multiple loads at the same time or I can certainly do a you know, kernel and, and loading something which is transferring data between the off-chip memory and on-chip memory at the same time. So here's, you know, I get, get bar and the load going in at the same time. And like any such loop, um, I could consider cases where I do unrolling or software pipelining and get overlap between multiple iterations. So here's two iterations. If you recall, there was a, uh, a outer loop around this. This outer loop is typically that strip mined loop or tiled loop. So you do typically have this case showing up. And you can just do the, the normal transformations where you unroll or software pipeline and you, you get multiple iterations overlapping. So BAS happens in parallel with the loads of the next iteration, for instance. This is just showing unrolled twice. So in addition to extracting parallelism, um, you can also allocate local memory using this handy data flow graph. Now you take the data flow graph uh, from which you can compute lifetimes in exactly the same way that you would compute uh, register lifetimes. You know, there's some stream uh, computed by this load that's used by BAS. It has a lifetime stretching from the beginning of that load to the end of BAS. Um, from those set of lifetimes, um, you can produce an interference graph. Um, from the interference graph, using a technique analogous to re register allocation, um, you can allocate the on-chip memory. It's slightly more complicated because unlike registers, you're dealing with things of variable size, um, but the, the semantics of read, writes, and updates are, are exactly the same. So again, going back to uh, what can we optimize, now, if you get something into a stream program form, the compiler basically takes care of figuring out how to fit it into the on-chip memory um, and extracting the parallelism um, between the kernels and the memory accesses, um, both of which um, are time-consuming things to do by hand. Okay. All right. So you write your program, you do this conversion, um, or you, you write your program in the stream fashion to begin with. Um, you run it through the compiler, you execute it, and it produces some performance, um, which, if you did the stream conversion well, is, is probably pretty good. Um, but typically, there's, there's some things that sh didn't get converted that should have been. Um, there are some cases where you artificially induce dependencies between things that don't need to be there. Um, some kernel turns out to take a lot longer than you thought it did. Uh, basically, your, your program is suboptimal. So we end up even with what I think is a pretty good compiler approach in this optimization cycle that I talked about at the start of the talk. And what we want to do is make this cycle go fast and we want to reduce the number of iterations. So what we need is some optimization goals. You know that as a programmer you want to make your application go faster. This is the list of things you do. And these goals should have certain qualities. They should be orthogonal. Okay? You shouldn't try and make one thing better and something else gets really bad. Um, they should be measurable. You need to know how well you're doing. 
so that you know where to invest your time. If this is the best, you know, this characteristic is ever going to get, you need to concentrate on another characteristic. You need to have a high payoff. You know, it's not worth it wasting your time on something that's not going to do anything for you. And lastly, and this is the, I think, the hard one for, um, you know, any sort of multi-core parallelization, um, uh, parallel programming technique, is you have to have some chance of achieving something approaching the maximum potential speed up of your architecture. And I think we do that. And the way we do that is to have three goals that are orthogonal, measurable, and have high payoff. So the first one is to convert loops to SIMD kernels. Basically, this is getting the data parallelism out of your program and making sure you communicate it to the compiler. And how do you measure how well you're doing this? Well, what you do is you start out with a program that in you can think of as occupying the control processor entirely. And as the control processor becomes more and more idle, the control processor utilization goes down, that means that you're shifting work onto the DPU. Not making any comments about how well you're doing that, but you're getting work onto the DPU. And because when you do that, you've cast it in the form of a kernel, which is inherently data parallel, you're getting a speed up equal to the SIMD width of the DPU. So basically, you, you can measure that characteristic, and you try and um, and, and uh, maximize, basically, the, uh, minimize the control processor utilization, which maximizes the stuff you've got on the DPU. And it maximizes it in a way that forces you to focus on the loops and such in your uh, program that actually matter. OK, so now you've got things in kernels. Well, are the kernels the best they can be? So they're on a VLIW processor. Um, how do you maximize their performance? Well, you improve the, the density of the VLIW code. Okay, there's a very easy measure of that. You can look at the, the achieved average IPC over the execution of a kernel. Now, the nice thing about this is that kernels, since they always operate on streams, they never cache miss. So the only characteristic you have to worry about is trying to run the IPC up. Since your program has been um, reduced to these bite-sized chunks, you know, each of which is a kernel, um, you can attack each individually, and you can say, this is the most important kernel for my application. I really need to get the IPC of that to be high. Um, you use techniques such as unrolling or software pipelining, which are automated by the compiler. The only thing the programmer has to do is request them, again, in this transparent fashion. The programmer makes the decisions. The compiler does the work. Um, and you get a speed up equal, potentially, to the number of ALUs uh, you have, you know, the width of your, your VLIW cores. Lastly, you've got everything in kernels. The kernels are good performance. You look at the utilization of the DPU relative to the memory system. So if you're doing a lot of things where you're doing a kernel that then stores some data back to the memory system, or stores some data off to memory, and then the next kernel has to wait for that data to get out to memory, load it again, and then process it, okay, what you've introduced is a situation where the DPU and the memory system aren't parallel. Okay? And this is going to downgrade DPU utilization, which is basically it, the DPU is utilized anytime it's doing a kernel. It's never cache missing, so it's, it's always doing something good. Um, and it's not utilized anytime it's not executing a kernel. So it's very easy to measure. Um, and it's pretty easy to uh, figure out what the root cause of, of low utilization is and improve it. Um, you know, showed some techniques for doing that based on the kernel uh, data flow graph, like applying these transformations like unrolling or software pipelining to an outer loop that contains kernels. So, so the, the payoffs are significant here, right? SIMD, SIMD width, um, you know, somewhere between 8 and 32. VLIW ALU, somewhere between 2 and 10, you know, up to 2. And these are ortho all are orthogonal, so they do multiply. Um, so your, your total speed up is, is roughly the, the product of the above. Now this does assume that you are not control processor bound, that the majority of your work can be shifted onto the DPU. But for most signal and image processing applications, um, that's a true statement. So just talking more about how you make this optimization cycle efficient. In addition to providing some clear goals and ways to measure them, you provide tools and visualizations that let you say, OK, this this goal is not being met. How do I meet it? For instance, uh, here's an illustration of use of the DPU, this middle column, and use of the memory system um, 
this far column um, over time. And time is running down the, the length of this graph. And loads, loads are represented by big blocks over here, and kernels are represented by big blocks on the, the DPU. And you can see that they're not really happening in parallel nearly as well as you would like. So looking at a diagram like this, you can say, OK, I know that my, you know, my third goal, my DPU utilization is low. I look at this diagram. I see where the problem is, and I fix the problem. Okay. So we think there's actually, you know, it's actually pretty easy to, to convert a stream program and to optimize it. And we think this has a really high payoff compared to um, what people usually do with conventional DS DSPs. So if you have you know, a conventional single processor DSP, um, you compile your code for it. It probably compiles C, so it compiles straight out of the box. You know, and you get decent performance. And then you go find some tight loops, and you start hand tweaking the assembly. So what you see is a, a, a speed up over time you know, as you expend effort that looks like this. Okay. Um, eventually, you get to the point where you're, you know, figuring out whether I can substitute an add and a multiply for a mall, and, you know, can I get this register usage slightly better? Um, and and your payoff becomes almost zero. But as you take your program and convert it um, to a stream program, which you do, you can do one loop at a time. You get these big jumps in performance uh, as each, you know, in increasingly. Um, you know, critical just by the nature of everything else has gotten faster, part of the application gets paralyzed. Um, so this, this is a nice conceptual graph, but, you know, one thing that we do have um, at SPI is we have an in-house applications department, which is actually bigger than the software tools team, and they're really trying to do this stuff. And this, this graph came out of, out of their experiences. Um, taking, you know, real applications like H.264, um, other video codecs, um, you know, other image processing uh, applications, um, and porting it. So just to summarize, um, I think you know, regardless of this specific technology, I think it is really worth thinking about compiler programmer partnership, um, how you can have an efficient division of labor how you can make the compiler transparent. You know, if you're publishing a paper, it's too easy to think, um, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show this great performance graph, because that's going to capture why my tool is good. All right? It's equally important, if not more so, that the programmer understand you know, what the compiler does to get that performance and how to make their code actually achieve what you're showing um, as the possible result. Also, you know, part of this process is it's never going to be right the first time. They're going to have to iterate. And anything that we can come up with that helps them with that cycle is at least as valuable as making the compiler smarter. As long as there is some way for them to communicate their realizations to the compiler. For them to say, I want to achieve this effect. What do I do to my code? So we think that stream programming is, is a pretty good example of applying this philosophy. Um, to deal with the problems of multi-core processors, and in particular, these, these stream processors, which are like SIMD multi-cores, um, highly optimized for DSP. Gives you a way to express data parallelism using kernels. Kernels look like functions, so it's pretty easy to understand. Um, it gives you an easy synchronization model. The only thing you have to worry about is kicking kernels off and occasionally waiting for them. Um, and it gives you a fairly simple way to explicitly manage memory. Well, you don't have to figure out how I'm going to deal with the you know, 96K or whatever of memory on the chip. You just have to figure out how to strip mine your program, change the array accesses so they use chunks called streams, still abstract, and the compiler will figure out roughly what the strip size should be and arrange the streams for you. The compiler can do a pretty good job of optimizing this stuff um, because kernels and streams have some really simple semantics that let it treat them a lot like operations and scalars. Uh, and I think we've only begun to sort of um, you know, go from the, the tip of this iceberg down in terms of you know, what can we do based on this simple model. You know, anything you can conceive of doing for a loop full of operations on scalars, we could do for a loop of, uh, of kernels. Um, 
However, no matter what the compiler does, it's not going to be as good as possible. So we present some goals that are orthogonal, measurable, have a high payoff, and you can actually achieve with real programs. So we do see you know, um, benchmarks with 80% you know, of, of peak type performance. Um, and going after this, because there's an efficient way to get there, um, and because the payoff is so large, it quickly outpaces tuning for a conventional DSP. You're much better off thinking about how do I parallelize this across 16 different processors than what can I possibly tweak in this already highly optimized bit of assembly. Um, so that's stream programming. I think it, it is a good way to um, avoid the oncoming semi-trucks of uh, um, painful manual optimization and um, opaque compiler optimization and uh, hopefully achieve something good in the end. So questions, please. Yes. So the applications that you have in mind are the ones you mentioned, the, uh, the DSP uh, image processing, signal process mentioned. Uh, this requires, this stream processing techniques that you've described requires a significant a part of the programmer, yes. uh, but does not port well. It's not something, you know, in future architectures, it's not something that they can take forward easily, right. necessarily. Well, yeah, I'd say a couple of things to that. One is DSP programmers are, are interesting breeds of programmers. They're already willing to invest incredible amounts of machine-specific time that doesn't even port between generations of the same processor, um, much less between different processors. We're uh, sitting in a meeting with a, a, a prominent uh, uh, hardware company, and they were talking about reducing the performance of operations so that they would conform to the previous performance of those operations and keep people's hand-tweaked assembly working, right? So I think this is, is a fairly, you know, this is an amount of effort that's lower than that, um, that gives you a much bigger payoff. Um, I do think you can take um, stream programs. You know, I would like to see a generic stream programming um, language arise. And I don't think it should be an entirely new language. It's just a C extension. Um, because you can, you can map it to different architectures. You can do this. The, the um, last, last place um, I worked was doing something similar to this um, across four different DARPA architectures. right? It's a, it's a fairly simple model. You have things that are SIMD parallel, and you have these chunks, these abstract chunks that you have to get onto the on-chip memory. Okay, so you can get it onto multiple architectures. Um, you know, it's not as abstract as some things like OpenMP. Um, the drawback of that is you can't, you know, probably run it efficiently on your cluster, right? Um, the advantage is that it's much easier to get good performance on an actual embedded multi-core starting from this than it is starting from OpenMP. Yes? How do you do You have to port them manually. How do you do what? Reductions. Reductions. Across the yeah. array or something. Right. So presently, you have to code them manually. The way, this is t the way that you, typically you can do this in a SIMD architecture, right, is you keep um, a component of the reduction in each SIMD processor. And then as like a little post um, you do the, the summing tree or whatever reduction tree. Um, so that's, that's not ideal, um, but, uh, but it does work. The other way to do it is, is to return it to the control processor because that reduction, generally compared to taking the large amount of data and computing the partial sums in each processor core, Doing the actual reduction itself is a, is a small amount of work. The final reduction, the, the tree. I, I think it is a general thing that you would want to do. Um, you know, we haven't added an explicit construct to it um, to do it. Um, I think it could be useful. But I do think there's a, another uh, often underused concept, which is Programmers are going to learn so much about your language or architecture. Um, try and make whatever you know, they can fit in that, that mental capacity as useful as possible. 
Um, if there's a way reasonably to achieve something with, with a small set of constructs, sometimes you're better off sticking with that small set of constructs than introducing a new one. Uh, I don't, reductions is, is one of those that I think is, is really on the edge and may, may be useful. Yes? Well, you mentioned the video compression is one of the applications for which this might conceivably be suited. How do you handle a 2D problem? I mean, this is very 1D oriented. So, again, it's important to realize that streams are, they're 1D really only in the sense that they have a specified 1D size, right? Your memory address space is inherently 1D. But the access of each SIMD processor may be 2D, right? So it may be, um, you know, what, basically, okay, if, you have a, if you're having a 2D image, there's two very simple models to use. Um, one is I'm going to tile the image and I'm going to load the data into streams such that each SIMD processor is going to be working on a single 2D tile all by itself, right? Another common model is, um, you know, just to take, um, to take a single tile and stripe it across the processors um, and use the, the permutation to exchange uh, results between them. Uh, but the, the, the first one that I described is, is generally far simpler and gets pretty good performance. But even if you want to do something, make, make a typical application, you need to motion, do motion estimation. You have two frames. You need to compare them and so on. Right. right. And for that, you're going to have edge issues. So you're probably going to have to overlap the tiles a little bit. And as soon as you have to do that, sort of your abstraction for breaking everything down um, comes unglued because now the tiling operation becomes more programmer visible. It depends on whether or not that overlap is on the inputs or on the outputs. You can always duplicate data, which is expensive, so you don't want to do it as a general principle. But for inputs, you know, you just load overlapping tiles without regard um, for each um, um, processor to work on. If the, the case where you'd want to use that second of the two 2D models that I described, where you just load in the whole tile, let it get striped across the processor lanes, and have the processors talk to each other, Okay, which is definitely more complex, is when there is almost complete overlap all the time. So it's basically, are they either orthogonal or do they overlap all the time? Um, when you have um, overlap on outputs, which is definitely a more complicated case, um, you have to think about how you want to structure the stores, right? Because each, um, it, you need some, some defined order that your results are going to overlay on top of one another in, right? Um, so one way that you can do this is there's a, a load or store primitive that just takes a stream of data and a stream of addresses and writes it out in that order. So if you generate the right stream of addresses, you can have your individual processors build up different tiles and then overlay them based on that stream in whatever order makes semantical sense, semantic sense, excuse me. Um, I'm, again, I, I think it's, I'm not necessarily claiming this model can express, is, is the easiest model to express everything in it, but it is one clear model that you can aim for. Uh, and we have definitely been able to take 2D transformations. I mean, everything we do is 2D and get it into this model. Yes? So, your roughly where compiler technology was in certain respects in the 70s and the 80s. Yes, so, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and I'm trying to make that, that, that be by choice rather than by, uh, but yes. Well, so what I'm wondering is when you're going to do things like these sort of interprocedural optimizations that like Ken Kennedy did at Rice. To, to some extent, I would say philosophically, don't do it. Stick with a simple set of optimizations that the programmer can understand. Yes. So just follow up to this, but a lot of times you might have, you know, simple optimizations like fuse the kernel, yes. split the kernel, so things like that. Do you do those kind of optimization? Right. The, those, I think, are a natural extension of this. Um, again, anytime you can do something that you can cast as a transformation on the, the data flow graph, um, you can achieve what's sort of my gating factor for an optimization being good. Um, which is, can you, already, can you always predictably do it well, right? 
If you have two kernels and you can always guarantee that fusing them is going to improve performance, by all means fuse them. It's also comprehensible to a programmer that it happened. I had two kernels, you know, the compiler produces some output saying it fused them and my performance gets better. Um, yes? So I don't think dimensionality is an issue. It, it, it has more to do, with, you know, in response to the question earlier, it has more to do with how you feed the screen, which brings me to a, a, a different question, which has to do with latency hiding mm -hmm. and double buffering and how you assemble the data that you gather from memory to feed the stream. Can you say something about the yes. architecture there? So this is, this far right is the generic case of double buffering. You know, I've got a strip mine loop. I've expressed the operations inside the loop as a set of kernels. You know, the simple case of double buffering is I load stream A, I compute on it to produce stream B, and I store that. Okay? Um, if you pipeline that loop, what you have is a double buffer. You think of it as, as a load, an operation, and a store, okay, in, in the, the simple operation sense, and you think of having pipelined that, the effect that you've achieved is double buffer. from memory while the, while the process is yes. Exactly. Yes. If, if the uh, <coughs> original problem changes by a small amount, it would be good to have kept the contributions of the, of the human in a form separate from the code so that you can apply them again to the slightly modified program. Um, I guess I think... That's hard I, to do, I, I grant you. I generally think of, I, I agree with you, though I generally tend to think of this as the abstract expression is the program. The bad thing that you don't want to do is have a whole bunch of, you know, programmer pragmas or hand-coded assembly that's very specific to a single architecture, right? So I think this is an abstract expression of a program where you've identified the parallelism and you identified the memory, um, uh, chunks, of, chunks of data that need to be in memory, and then you know, if you change the program slightly, you change that abstraction slightly, okay? And the compiler, because you've already got it expressed in a form it understands, does the, you know, nitty-gritty bookkeeping to, to keep up with that change. I'm not sure whether that answered your question. I'm afraid of, of a trivial change having to require the, 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 the several cycles of the optimization again. Start from scratch. Yeah, yeah. Start from scratch. Yeah, probably. That's unavoidable. I, yeah. I don't, and do we have a good, I mean, if we have a good example where someone has an abstract way of formulating a program. I mean, there, I've seen some examples of mathematical formulations of DSP programs, um, but I have yet to see sort of a, an industrial ver strength version of it. I think it's, it's a neat thing to think about, um, but I'm, I'm worried that it's yet another incarnation of the oncoming semi-truck. Um, well, I, I think I think the iteration with the programmer is useful. I, right. I buy that. Mm -hmm. I hate to buy it through every phase of the, every cycle of the so specifications. Right. The, the hope is that you have a small change to the problem that implies a small change to your program. Again, thinking about all the things that are orthogonal. Like any kernel you didn't touch, it's still optimized. The original right? program is small. The modified program, I'm afraid, is a few times as big. Understanding it right. is a load for a new programmer. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I, again, sometimes simple answers are the best ones. You know, make it fairly simple to do the transformation. Make it really simple to turn the crank. Um, you know, these are architectures where people seriously consider spinning an ASIC as an alternative, right? Um, so if you can, you know, do something that lets you get really great performance on a parallel architecture in under a month, you've pretty much achieved the goal. Yeah, I think there's a question back there. Between the processing power and the memory bandwidth, as a nice what? As a nice balance between the processing power in terms of flops, memory bandwidth, as, as in terms of... You mean as, as in a good ratio, or...? Ratio. What's the typical ratio in such architectures, or what do you, do you see in the common applications that you work with? So, I'm going to give you a less precise answer than an architect would. You should ask, you know, an architect for a more precise answer. 
One of the concepts we talk about in the particular stream architecture we work with, and you can also read about this in the Imagine architecture that was to some extent its, its historical precedent, is the bandwidth hierarchy, where there's almost an order of magnitude jump between the off-chip memory, the access to the on-chip memory, and the access to the registers that are within the SIMD processor cores. So if you figure that's about 100 to 1, um, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty high. Um, now that's, that's potential. Um, in general, you want as much memory bandwidth as you can get. I mean, that's, that's just the blanket answer. Um, but if you do a good job, you know, again, by using things like explicitly compiler managed memory, you may be able to tolerate uh, up towards 100 to 1, I think. Yes? There is a slide in the presentation we had in the fall quarter on the 3 website. You can download the slides from Professor Daly's talk. And um, Bill, Bill Daly had a slide that's, I remember seeing that, the same one that Peter was describing where you have the actual bandwidth is listed for the memory, the local memories, and then the register file bandwidth. So you can at least get a rough idea from that. Yeah. What fraction of your cycles are actually spent in code that normal programmers write as compared to subroutines that somebody did a lot of work on and got right, you know, the FFT subroutine? Um, I, I can again say, you know, it's the lines of code, right, is on the, the things we work on because they haven't been integrated into the surrounding application, right? It's just a video codec, for instance. Um, yeah, I'd probably say it's, it's probably even the sort of surrounding support lines and the actual lines invested in kernels. I would say by the time you put, you know, something that uses that codec around it, it's going to be a higher ratio. As to the ratio between compute time, um, it's, it's massively on the side of the DPU, right? Um, you know, almost all of the application has been translated into this stylized kernel form, and, you know, 90% you know, of your cycles go there. Well, is that code done by the, the, the sort of local programmer, or, or, or did somebody off in a library, that, 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 the guy writing the code? Oh, I see what you're asking. Um, you know, right now we've done most of our applications in-house. Uh, we do have, you know, several customers who are actually getting good performance using this, which is a, a significant qualification that someone other than the people who wrote the system can, can do good work with it. Um, but we haven't yet distributed an image processing library with it, which is what you need, right? This, this is the next step is to say, okay, you can reduce this work even further if you have an image processing library. Now, the neat thing is you could conceive of an image processing library expressed in this fashion, which isn't terribly machine-specific, that could be ported fairly easily across different architectures. An interesting concept. I think there's a question in the back, yeah. Yeah, so if the programmer, basically my question is, do you really need streaming architecture if you have to do all of this work, right, to figure out the parallelization, and then, you know, in, four, in two years, Intel will have multi-core, multi-core multi chip, and you can basically do the same thing. Do you really need the hardware? Um, okay, so this is, this is an interesting question. Um, there are a, a couple of, of things. First of all, you know, if you say, do you need one relative to a DSP? You know, this is why you need one relative to a DSP. It's just a better return on your effort. Um, if you say relative to the hypothetical Intel, you know, N cores chip, um, if you think achieving data parallelism on a SIMD architecture is hard, try doing any sort of parallelism on a truly multi-core architecture. If you think, um, you know, achieving good use of memory bandwidth um, on something like this is, is hard, where you can see, um, you know, when your loads and stores are, are dominating your application, um, where you, you, the compiler actually does a pretty good job of managing the memory for you, try getting it out of a cache system where 20 different processors are competing. Um, you know, I think, I think rather the more interesting question, which I'd like to have an answer to, seriously, um, 
is what is it you really do well with a 64 standard, you know, x86 style core stamped onto a die? What do you do with it? Um, whereas if you look at, you know, the growth of the embedded space, where you have these applications that nicely fit this fairly easy to optimize model, um, I think this, this is, is, is potentially more interesting. Um, there will always be a need for transaction type processing, but that's an entirely separate question. Okay, the, the compiler eventually generates a code that explicitly manages the memory and so on. Yeah. But I can imagine how to lay this out on top of caches. You know, if the compiler knows about cache and it can uh, issue some fancy prefetch command, which yeah. prefetches, you know, a bunch of data into the cache and doing, you know, things very similar to what you're doing essentially in, in this architecture. Oh, absolutely. That's one of the neat things that you, you could do is, is to take a stream program, have a very simple transformation that puts it onto a cache multicore. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're willing to embrace this model, of course it's a, and you, you say, yeah, I can compile it efficiently for a multicore. Now the thing is, from a hardware perspective, that multicore will not be as efficient as a stream processor. Right? So basically, if you can make your application look like this, you may as well get a stream processor. The stream processor does a bunch of things like not having to support the cache and having SIMD control so the cost of instruction overhead is amortized across all the processors and a bunch of things at a hardware level that make it more efficient. The, the, when you want the general multicore is when you have heterogeneous workload. So what I guess I'm trying to find is examples of really performance intensive heterogeneous workload that aren't memory bound. Yes? I think that brings up an important point. The processor you're describing is rather more special purpose than a general purpose uh, uh, computer. Yes. Uh, because um, you know, if your processor is a general purpose computer, then resource competition is a serious issue when there are multiple applications trying to utilize the architecture. Absolutely. So your processor is rather more an embedded processor yes. than the Intel many core processors, which are really intended to be more general purpose. Right. Absolutely. I, the, there's a whole wider set of problems there. I do think, again, looking at how you can practically program things, I do think multi-core is going to call for domain-specific approaches. There'll be big domains. There'll be things like transaction processing or regular DSP applications or bit processing. Um, but I'm, I'm skeptical about the ability to produce any language or compiler flow that, you know, one compiler flow to rule them all. So your processor, in fact, for the general purpose application programmer will be hidden behind the library that would, right. that would basically execute code that had previously been optimized. Yes, so I'd, I'd say that's the subsystem. A, a more common case. And you might see, you very might see something like this as a subprocessor. You know, if you've got all the space to put down 32 cores, you know, you could put down, you know, eight standard cores and 24 highly efficient cores in this fashion, and you'd probably end up with a better chip. Yes? Can you draw a comparison to the programming models on the clear speed board and, and GPUs? Okay. Um, I haven't worked extensively with clear speed. Um, the one thing that I do know about it. Can you repeat the question? I, I repeat the question. Yes, he asked um, to draw a comparison to programming models for clear speed and GPUs. Um, so this answer could be completely wrong. Um, on clear speed, I think they're still doing slightly modified loops. Another approach that I'm skeptical of because it's just not very clean. You know, it's one of those things where, oh, I've hacked in a couple of pragmas and I've, I've used this slightly special form in this loop and it just, it works for this example and then you try and use it. Um, until you have that nice clean semantics that gets you to a data flow graph that you can start to really reason about with a compiler and guarantee that you can, you know, do something good, um, I think you're, you're, you're restricting yourself. Uh, for GPUs, programming GPUs is hell, to be frank. Um, they're getting more general, but they have all these bizarre features um, that mean even though the language looks like it's sort of general purpose, um, either the compiler is, you know, harboring an AI or um, you're going to put in some code that looks like it should work and you're going to get back a list of long error messages like can't store to two separate memory addresses at the, you know, something like that. Uh, I think, you know, in, in general, if you want to do embedded processing and you have a choice between a screen processor and a DPU, 
take the general, the more general purpose processor, it, it will make your life a lot easier. Yeah. As a point of reference, what would be SPI's processor of choice today? Had to say, our best processor right now, our best target platform is, what platform would that be right now? Which processor? Would it be the tower piece? Would it be the uh, cell processor? Would it be? So, we're, you know, we are a processor company. So, you know, we do have, we have real hardware. The hardware works. Um, you know, we have initial customer engagements. That would be our processor of choice, right? In the commercial world, I think Cell is closest to what we're describing. Um, you know, they did a good job of avoiding unnecessary features. However, it's still a heck of a lot more power hungry than this type of architecture. Um, I can draw the very simple block diagram. But some of the ways in which you construct the, the stream buffers that you efficient access to your on-chip memory and the register files that enable you to really shrink down the SIMD cores um, are very particular to this type of architecture and get us much better uh, power efficiency and actually overall performance as well. What kind of power performance differences today would you expect from your cell can say versus a cell processor? Take your best application versus the same thing on a cell. Um, conservatively, you know, three to five maybe. X, better. Power efficiency. Power per op is, is probably significantly better, but just overall power consumption. Um, so, I don't know the, the cell um, number off the, the top of my head, so I don't know what the I only have half of the ratio. Um, you know, I, you'd actually know better. We've, we've released the actual numbers in terms of number of, I Bruce doesn't really yeah, complete. They are in the edge of okay, great. some things, but it's hard to compare because if you're not running the same apps right. on those two processors, you can't really get a half without this comparison. Right. So, so our actual implementation of this processor is 16 cores wide. Each core is a five wide VLIW. Um, you know, so that's 80x, and it runs at um, somewhere north of uh, half a gigahertz. So um, that's pretty high performance. Can you just tell my um, Yeah, I think demanding uh, video encoding um, is definitely one of them. There are a couple others, but they're early enough in our customer activities that I don't want to identify specifically. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, sure. Comment. Since you're talking about fact the speaker five in power, future cell will be able to reach that too. Just an argument for right. argument's sake. Right now we're in a. Um, I, again, you know, take all my architectural answers with a slight grain of salt. There is an ISCC paper which gives you better results. We are in a very conservative process achieving that. Um, so. We've got a lot of, of running room as well. Um, I, I think just in terms, just taking them as an abstract architectural, from an abstract architectural view, um, there's just a lot of things that, unless you have them, um, you're, you're giving up um, power efficiency um, that this architecture has that a cell does not. Um, I don't think they might adopt some of these generally useful. I think our, our lawyers might enjoy that. Um, so. Can you see an evolution going on? Because if in fact the three to five, eventually a couple of years, that fact might disappear. Hey, as, I, as I said, that, that was a conservative number. And I, you know, from a marketing point of view, I wish I was giving you a more aggressive number. I'm just trying to come up with something that I, I, I know is real. Um, it's less, less than a handful that tends to wash out sooner or later. Well, the differentiation differentiating feature of the processor is not this, the, the individual processes. You are talking about the individual processes, right? Um, I'm talking about, about chips as a whole, right? I mean, this. Right, you've got a VLI. Uh, w architecture, as, as was said earlier, it's very hard to compare processes right. within some margin. Your differentiation is the stream architecture. Right. Um, yeah, so you can, you can certainly build a SIMD architecture in which the processor cores are VLIW. Uh, it looks very much like this. Um, you know, on the other hand, that's a lot of R&D effort. We have one, uh, and we also have, you know, a compiler that works for it. Um, also a lot of R&D effort. So, 
you know, in some sense, I'm, I'm very happy that that seems to be an obvious path forward because it means good things for us as a company, right? Acquisition is generally more cost effective than development. Um, you know, I, I do think there is, there is again, there's that, that set of features which are just logical when you look at, we want a very simple architecture. It looks like this. It's a SIMD VLIW. What do we do to make it better? We stick on this, this set of features and we develop compiler tools for that and, and those are unique and proprietary to us. All right, um, anything else? Um, oh yes, I did want to mention that we, um, we've, we've filled one of our open compiler positions, but we are still definitely looking for good uh, compiler people. Um, you know, I do, do think that this is a exciting stuff to be working on in industry right now. You can see multi-core being a fairly hot field, and I think we have an approach that isn't just let's slap down a bunch of cores on a chip and you know, see how, how much PowerPoint we can generate on it, but is actually uh, something something practical that gets really good performance, and we're looking for good people who can help us program it. Thank you. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.